Hi everyone. Um, I did my final presentation on the history of measurement and my main focus was linear measurement. So before we um, get into the, the pedagogy and the history, I just wanted to define what a measurement, the study of measurement is. Um, basically it's when you're trying to quantify something in terms of its length, area, volume, mass, weight, time, energy, work, etc. So again, like I said, I'm mostly focusing on quantifying length and how that was done over time. The main goals of my presentation and kind of, you know, a little bit of an outline in, in terms of what to expect. Uh, the goals I have were to look at some current research on our mathematical performance, both nationally and globally in the area of measurement. I wanted to look historically at how ancient societies used an applied measurement. Uh, I wanted to um, look at the similarities and differences across different cultures and societies. And I wanted to study where and when did the need for a standard approach to measurement come about. Um, in my presentation, I'll outline some research and some data about student performance. I'll talk about current pedagogy in elementary and middle schools. I will touch on the mathematical content knowledge and the history and they're, they're you know, interrelated. And I will briefly go over the description of my teacher created curricular materials and I will quickly reflect on how this project went for me. So looking at the research, um, measurement is found to be a global weakness in general. So figure one kind of shows us how that looks. So the US average for correct, percent, the percentage of correct um, questions answered within that content area, the U.S. scored the lowest out on measurement than they did on, on others um, in other domains. And internationally, um, every, every country was scoring lower on measurement than they were in the other categories. And so um, it was also found that over the past 13 years, measurement scores have been consistently lower than that of other mathematical domains, and this is an issue in terms of how many students are going into science-related careers. And being that, you know, right now STEM is such a huge thing, this, this is an issue for our country. Um, additionally, there's a racial achievement gap that's, that's pretty significant. If you look at the second figure, um, the gap between African American and Caucasian students is continuously um, pretty high in the area of measurement. So looking at these figures, the idea is that measurement isn't our strongest category and it isn't globally either. So we have a, you know, an international problem. There's more research that was done, but this is specifically on measure, uh, metric system and, and how you, American students did on questions that related to the metric system. And what they found was that, again, there, you know, there was a discrepancy. Um, so third and fourth graders were tested. And so if you look at the questions to the, to the left, um, noting that K7 and L6 are items that are kind of uninvolved with the metric themselves, but more so I think it's one is multiplication. And I think, well, there are, other con there are other concepts. But on the remaining three or four questions, the US students did rather poorly. Um, you know, with less than half of students, for the most part, getting the answer correct. Um, so that's, again, for the metric system, performing on, on questions related to that. So people have um, thought about why measurement is a weakness, and many people attest to the fact that measurement is a weakness in the United States because we are responsible for learning two different systems, the customary and the metric. Um, other people will say that, you know, it's kind of as opposed to the fault of how many we have to learn, it's more so how it's taught. And, um, you know, not only are students oftentimes expected to learn how to measure, you know, using pictures on a worksheet and, you know, this one modality, not only that, the metric system can be um, treated more of an introduct as an introductory topic than anything else. And there's not really a focus on conceptual understanding of what it means to measure. There's low level knowledge and skills and students don't really need to put in a lot of thought into what they're expected to do in terms of linear and other measurement um, areas too. So people recommend um, that there should be an integration of measurement with other content strands and subject areas. Science is one of the, the main opportunities to do that. Um, giving students opportunities to have hands-on experiences using a variety of measurement tools, 
and focusing on the concepts of measurement as opposed to the rote memorization of formulas. Um, it has been said by a mathematical researcher, Arthur Baruti, that measurement problems ca can involve, if they're crafted the right way, they can involve great opportunities to practice inquiry in a very purposeful way. And one of the things that is, is really key is instruction should focus on what it means to measure as opposed to only how to measure, and that's kind of how it looks right now. I also um, found two different researchers. They kind of, they you know went in a bit of a stage or phase process for how students develop a concept or how children develop a concept of measurement, and they're actually pretty comparable with a few minor differences, but. Um, looking, for example, at INSKEEPS for development stages of learning measurement, stage one involves the perception in terms of students kind of come to school with an intuition for attributes in terms of length, weight, temperature, and time. And they can talk about these attributes informally. Stage two is when measurement can be deduced using comparison. For example, this object is taller or this object is heavier than the other. And so children have the ability to compare two things based on their attributes. Stage three involves um, measurement as a quest for the referent, meaning students can talk about how big, how long something is, how heavy something is, um, its capacity, but in a non-standard unit. So a lot of students will use you know, linking blocks and how many blocks does it take to, to measure up with this, this item. And so non-standard units are totally, actually they're, they're recommended to be used during stage three. And stage four is dealing with measurement as a system in terms of the standard systems that we know, including the customary and metric system. Um, Baruti's are very similar. Phase one involves identifying attributes. Phase two is about comparison. However, phase three and phase four kind of dif differ. Um, he it describes phase three as using a four-step measurement process to make indirect comparisons in terms of students' process to comparing a unit to an unknown quantity. They go through phases including identification of the attribute, the selection of an appropriate unit, which is the number two, the comparison of units to the object, and the report of a number. So he gives this kind of phase pro or this step process, this four step process for what you do when you're measuring an object. And then he describes phase four as moving from non-standard to standard. And so that's similar again to Inskeep's model. Um, the document here can be visited at a later time. It basically describes the progression from kindergarten to fifth grade, um, how the standards change from year to year. I thought it was interesting, and I hadn't been aware of this before, but the last measurement standard as described by Common Core is actually in fifth grade. And so after fifth grade, students are really not getting any more instruction on measurement. Um, it's reasonable that they would get application problems as, as it relates to measurement, but there will be no more instruction. So the elementary years are extremely crucial because once middle school hits, students are really not getting any more instruction in that. And so that should be, you know, even more incentive for us to, to look at the way we teach measurement. I have done research on the history of measurement for four main periods. Um, I looked at ancient Egypt, Rome, 10th century England, which spanned my research spanned about like 300 or 400 years, and then Europe in the 16-1700s as I was trying to emphasize um, the development and the start of the metric system. So in Egypt around 5,000 BC, um, it was, it's been said that ancient Egypt has had the, mo the most, the first reasonably uniform measurement system, and this is because their society was thriving and they needed a way to refer to um, distance and, and so forth. For example, you'd, you'd have many different people working on, thousands of people even, working on a pyramid at one time. And so in order to have those people be on the same page in terms of, of the standardized unit, everyone would need to be referring to the same unit as the same magnitude. Um, early measurement systems were, were based mostly on human body parts. And so if you look at this image to the right here, early Egyptian records indicate that length was measured by the cubit, which is, spans the forearm, a hand, or what was also referred to as a palm, which is the width of, of your hand or palm, and a finger or a digit, which is the width of, your, of one finger. Um, the cubit was the most commonly used measurement tool, and it was, it was used during construction. Um, 
there was a need for a standard cubit, like I mentioned, to aid in construction with a lot of people involved. And so um, they created the royal cubit, which was seven palms long. And this was actually based on the um, size of the leader, the pharaoh's cubit at that time. And so in order to make sure that everyone had that same tool, because you know not every pyramid worker could use the span of his or her cubit, they had to create a, a ruler. Um, so a royal cubit master was carved out of granite to endure for a long time. And workers who were at the structures were given cubits, but either made from wood or granite. Um, interestingly, there was actually someone who was in charge of making sure that all the workers got cubits, rulers. And um, this is kind of a funny thing, but each full moon, the, that person was required to bring back the cubit sticks from the construction site to be compared again with that one main royal cubit master. And so if that, if that person did not bring back the sticks for comparison on the night of the full moon, it was a discretion punishable by death. So that's a pretty interesting thing to share with students. Um, another, you know, biblical times kind of coincided with this. And there's this interesting chart that c refers to some biblical lengths as described in the Bible with their modern approximations. And so, um, again, just as many other units and societies did, but Bible measurement words change their value from time to time. And so you had a rod here that did not mean the same thing, you know, years later. And so this would be something interesting to also have students look into. Um, Rome was significant because, and this is meant thousands of years later after Egypt, but it was significant because they were the first society to really focus on long distances. Um, and so Julius Caesar approved a method for measuring distances using a thousand paces in which each pace was two steps. So um, the Roman mile equated 1,000 paces or 200 steps, and this was a, said to be about 5,000 Roman feet. And a Roman foot needs to be defined. It was usually divided into um, sec 12 sections and sometimes into 16 sections. And, and though the Romans inherited the word foot from Egypt, it was not the same size. And this was often the case. You had different societies ref using the same unit name, but the magnitude of that unit was much different. And so that posed a lot of problems. England in the 10th century um, was another area of my study. And so I decided to focus on some, some key parts in this general area. And so I have the beginning and a little in the mid 10th century. And so um, this is kind of where our modern customary system can kind of be derived, I suppose. During uh, the very first part of the 10th century, all English measures were defined in terms of an inch, where three grains of barley dry, chosen from the middle of an ear, full and round. They, three grains of barley made an inch, 12 inches made a foot, three feet made an ulna or, or yard, and five and a half ulnae made a rod. And so um, just a, a couple of interesting facts about the yard. It was established in 1066 and King Henry stated that it measured from the tip of his nose to his outstretched finger. Um, the barley corn is equivalent to about 8.5 millimeters and it was actually the, the length of an actual barley corn. And an inch was equivalent to three of those. A rod or a perch, they're kind of you know, synonyms. It was a traditional Saxon land measure that was originally, defi originally defined as the total of the length of the feet, the first 16 men to leave church on a Sunday morning measure. So they referred to it in that way. In 1197, King Richard I had a, a pretty big um, accomplishment he standardized the yard and so he stated that it was that it was lawful to ensure that the yard was used of the same size throughout his kingdom and lastly in 1592 they um agriculture in terms of ox, using ox oxen to to plow fields was used to define many different units and so for long was the distance a team of oxen could plow an acre was um the amount of land tillable by one man behind one ox in one day. An ox gang was the amount of tillable land by one ox during the entire plowing season and so forth. And so, um, of course, these have numerical equivalencies, but this is, this is the history behind how these units were derived.